Uh, my name is Bill Coachman. I live at 1832 Pinecone in Moscow. Um, we started in the market uh, 20 plus years ago. My wife came with a pretty long career in the food business. She was uh, with Napua Stevens in Hawaii where they did a show for two years, dining in the islands. Napua did Hawaiian food and Perry did the rest of the world. <laughs> and then she came here when, and after a number of other assignments I had and she accompanied me. And uh, she started in the market and uh, the market was interesting in those days. It, there was no coordination. Everybody just sold what they wanted to sell in the food area, plant area. So she said, oh, I have a lot of flowers. I'll sell cut flowers. And we had Mary, I believe was her name. She was the market manager, the only person. I think we paid $60. And at the end of the market, we had enough money for a lunch, coasted by Mary. And we had a half hour meeting. No rules, no regulations. Just if you have a problem, she'll take care of it, particularly interface with the city. We didn't know who. But we had a problem, she'd help us, and the city would somehow magically take care of it. Um, we get to the point where we were real happy and the food thing was successful because nobody had any food, I think for a number of years. She said six, I don't know. But people got hungry towards the end of the day, and uh, both the vendors and the customers. Then uh, we were invited to go out into the food court since we were a food, and there were a few others accreted to the thing. And we started the food court, and uh, she had a problem always getting the raw materials. We had a farmer friend, uh, Alvin Gusky, and so we learned about the, the seed, seed producers, the seed, the seed factories. And they always had lentils, great, world class, and uh, we got garbanzo beans. Now, Perry's a perfectionist. She's a real chef. She cooked for the arts, uh, not for the, um, <coughs> the pea lentil. She demonstrated foods at big ag shows like in Seattle uh, in competition with the, uh, at that time was the uh, people from the south with all the southern food and the trappies were there, the, the children. And uh, we stopped selling, de demonstrating food. We started doing dancing because they liked to dance and cook. They didn't like to really sell anything. So anyway, starting off here, it all worked fine. The biggest problem we had is we're at a high latitude here, 4640 Moscow. And the farmers around here, local farmers, uh, can't grow <laughs> tomatoes, even in a greenhouse that tastes like tomatoes. And that's common in the world. I mean, a huge gap project, which is the biggest one, it's in Brazil and in Asia Minor. They're getting rid of their greenhouses. The so people won't buy the food. It just isn't a tomato anymore. It will transport all right, but it doesn't have a tomato flavor. You get a tomato when you leave it out in the open field, the wind blowing, ultraviolet sterilizing everything from the sun, and you don't have problems with pesticides, with fungus, and all the other things that are associated with. So the greenhouse is not popular. And the Europeans are very particular on food. A chef will not cook something unless he has the right ingredients. It's the same when Perry turns out something and we get two or three hundred customers start screaming for it. It's because it tastes good. And her opinion, and I think a lot of chefs, they say the food has to be perfect. Tomato has to be ripe. Skin has to be tender. The taste has to be that of a tomato. And uh, one, one thing that happened right after that was the, uh, I call them the anchors, uh, Tone Maker and uh, Durfee. They came with their trucks. They had huge amounts of food at cheap prices, and they listened to the students. I spent three weekends at the Durfee place. We very cook for them. During the day, they were kind enough to show us exactly what they were doing for the farmer's market. Here were some seeds from a Chinese student. All they wanted was bok choy. Here was a tenth of an acre in bok choy. So every, every Saturday, here came, and you had a whole bin of bok choy, not one of at a reasonable price, and it tasted like bok choy, and they started lining up at 7.30 in the morning to buy it. So when we get to the situation of uh, turning out some food, you have to have like a, a, a big pepper, twice a 200 tub size, you had to have it tender, you had to have it have a peppery flight, taste, Fill, a, fill the, uh, fill the uh, tub, throw the, her yogurt sauce on it, and you had a whole meal for a very small amount of money. And that was, we thought, what the farmer's market should be. It should allow farmers to bring whatever food they had to the market, 
offer it to the public at a reasonable price, and then have both sides benefit. The public from buying the food, enjoying it, the farmers from getting rid of either the surplus food or food they needed a market for. And I think that's correct as far as the, the raisin de etra for the farmer's market. And at, we're leaving the farmer's market for various reasons, and not any of the things that have been discussed tonight. But one thing I think I can offer to you as a suggestion. I've been all over the world many, many times, looked at markets. I wrote to work with one of the members of the Meinzer Mark plots, started over 2,400 years ago, still in a little square in the center with a big cathedral, still with about the same number of vendors. Some change, but not, you know, every 100 years is a different vendor. Um, and he, we talked about markets and you know how to organize them, ones that work best, and all the whys about what they have done and how the results came out. I wrote a paper about four years ago, unbeknownst to me of any change in market location. And the title of the paper was The Linear Versus the Square Market Format and All the Reasons Why You Want One or the Other. And all these things have happened here for that paper. I'm not just saying because I wrote it. I inherited a lot of the ideas from my carpooling partner. But what I see as a problem here versus the rest of the markets in the world that I've seen, and there's quite a few, because I do have an interest in markets. And the, our expert might well, I wish I would talk to him, he might, we've had a lot of similar thoughts, I'm sure. Uh, the thing is that, like, classic markets are square. That's why they talk about the market square. Classic markets are divided by groups of things. You don't have one vegetable, big vegetable vendor, or one that's anchoring, at one end, and the other, at the other end of a linear market. People are going to go to the one and not the other because of the distances involved. And it's hard on people that are older and people that don't have time. So I think a very good idea is to cluster the markets, put all the crafts in one place, put all the food producers in another place, maybe the organics in another place, and have them logically located, topologically, so that people don't have to walk. The old market was easy. You just, oh, I forgot something over at Tower Makers and I was over at Drifters. You hop over there in three seconds. So, Mr. Coachman, will you share your paper with the uh, Farmers Most Market Commission? Most of the people, commission? I think there's a lot of people that have it. I'll try to dig it off my hard Please drive. Do. And, mm -hmm. I'll, uh, and you can just look at it and say, oh, if oh, you, yes. If you send it He's to another, me or, or yeah, to I'll, city I'll, staff, we'll I'll, I'll find Kathleen. It. Okay, and then the, the other thing I'm very concerned about is I, will, I like, I'm not the cook, but I like looking at people's reactions while I'm serving things or that. And there's nothing like, even though it's a prohibited product, a family getting a, a flat of blueberries. And they're all talking about putting it on their cereal. And they're all talking about it not costing $3 for a little tiny container. And there's, there's, there's so many little, little things that the market produces in the customer base. And they're very important. The clustering is good. The, I don't see how we're ever going to do without the major food providers like Durfee and, and Tommy, regardless if one, one lives a further distance than 150 okay, miles. Okay, so you're advocating for a oh, policy gosh, that yes. allows outside the, the immediate region. Okay. It surged the moment we got those two guys on the food court. They were on one side, the food vendors were on the, the north side, and then the whole thing took off uh, sales-wise. And uh, we needed them. We needed uh, peppers that you could hit with a hammer and they would fall apart, splatter, rather than ones that you get at the stores, which are half the size you hit, and they bounce away. And you, the hammer, you look to see if it's not broken or not. And so the quality is, and the, the price and all the things go, and people come, old people, seniors, uh, young people, people that don't have today very much money. Okay. And they used to buy a, a crate of uh, whatever they sold. Now, um, trying to make, uh, I'll finish with this. All of my, uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, the, uh, one of the vendors is just a shadow of itself, just a van, and runs out of corn at 9 o'clock in the morning. And our market closes much later than that, Durfee. And Tony Maker hasn't the variety anymore. He used to have 20 of the 27 peppers available in this country. 20. 
and you go to the store, and as far as bell peppers, there's three. There's orange, there's uh, uh, red, and there's green. They all look alike. They all taste alike. They all resemble the strawberries from California that are burpy ad, but taste like cucumbers. They don't have any strawberry face. And uh, he's providing 20 real peppers that have, are, I'm sure, not uh, just grown just as peppers were from what we call now heirloom seeds. And the price is for her preparing food, and other people like to use them. Without those, and I think they're over the 1,500-mile limit, you're not going to have a market, as far as in the food produce area, that is really worthwhile because it doesn't – the latitude prevents us from growing tomatoes, prevents us from growing um, peppers. Uh, my wife loves to make dishes out of uh, – Eggplant? We have no eggplant. We never well, had. Well, Mr. Coachman, I, I was sorry to hear that you and Perry are considering leaving the yes. market, but I hope that your voice of experience will be very valuable. I hope you will share that with yeah, the, and I will the, send you uh, the Farmers copy Market of Commission the, as well. I hope so. Please do. Please. That's, uh, we enjoyed the market. We had a fun run of 21 years, right. and we'd like to leave a little bit. People have asked for our recipes. Unfortunately, as a chef or as a cook, my wife doesn't have recipes. She's continually changing everything incrementally. And these people like, we have the farmer's wives that have production kitchens, and they're doing garbanzo. He has, this farmer has 3,000 acres. They have a million dollar production kitchen. They want to do something. They want to put an aluminum sack that you can open, and you'll get Perry's garbanzos. Now that she's thinking of doing, but you know, well, that's you, another good will thing. I should, plus, you might make a few pennies doing it. Yeah. But, uh, You'll please keep us posted and, and wish Perry the we best, will. too. Thank, Thank you, you for so your much. comments tonight. We appreciate it, Mr. Thank Coachman. Thank you.